Gentlemen, welcome back to the shop. I've been dipping my tip in the dark side of the force. The Wood Elf Planer Robot. Here the local scumbags had but two of the varietals. I decided to go with the built-in theft deterrent teal, despite it being lower weight. It is made in the USA, and the bumblebee uh, DeWilt was made in. Now you can tell this is made in the USSA on account of lazy-eyed Eduardo being made head of the stipper application department. The Jesus thing's on sideways. Look at that. For frog snack. As the French say, de qu'est-ce que fuck? Just lift and tuck this out of the way. There's even a little rabbit here in order for the sticker to go on the right place. That is a stark reminder of what shitty lackadaisical management gets. More worried about submitting their time off than making sure that the Jesus thing is built right. Speaking to ain't right, the astute amongst you will note that I broke the prime directive of bumblefuckery. That is, normally we fix it till it's fucked, but in this case, worked a lot better than I thought it would, even in that not completely seasoned wood. You see the resin picking up on it, but not on the blades. If I had to guess, I like this style too. Non resharpenable. Like a machinist thing, you, it's got the two cutting edges and when it's fucked, it's fucked. Some of them fellas like polishing their slicks. Hey, <laughs> ain't nobody got time for that. Comes with a handy dandy squinch. Three fasteners, and out she comes. I take a couple Phillips out too, apparently. Set these aside, lose them for later. Interesting affixation. That's the cutting edge there. Swappable. Just starting to pick up an itty bit of resin. Now, if this is Kunstain Tongue Glide, the Paragon of Materials, which I believe it is, that resin will fuck you before anything else. Uh, I'm getting all choked up about it. Pardon me. Magnets, how do they work? Now that might just be the nickel binder. It is magnetic, but it might just be the nickel binder. Instead of cobalt, they're using quite a bit of nickel to bind those particles of ceramic tungsten carbide. We'll have to do some further testing, but we'll check the hardness with the onion test. Ken Onion, mind. That's uh, tears you cry when you gotta pay for one of his knives. Luckily, this was a gift. This is S30V steel. Hard as a nail hammered Jesus's hand. You see that? Ah! You ever want to find a paper cut? Just get yourself some of this stuff. Cun uh, tungsten carbide. Fantastic. Now, it doesn't have the cobalt binder. It doesn't seem to have very much cobalt binder. So it won't be as impact resistant as you know a drill bit or something like that carbide but it's still carbide still sharp we're just getting rid of the resin for when we get her back together the other nice thing about carbide as an artifact of the manufacturing which you don't get with hss high speed steel is that these have to be ground and sharpened with diamond 
That means they got to be fairly accurate. So you get a better grind with carbide than you do with steel because steel you can grind any old way. Now the way this works for the depth of cut adjustment, here's the blade here. So that's going thinner and that's going thicker, which shows you see the difference in the plane here. Let's see, let's get that out of the way. Something more like that. Under this little cover here, we got the pulleys, serpentine, not a serpentine belt, but a V-groove pulley with looks like polyester threads through it and urethane, not rubber, but urethane. These pulleys, of course, are sintered metal and then cooked so that all the grains cook together. There's the basal platen, straight die cast aluminum. Fly cut on the surface. You see a little programming error here or maybe just an artifact of not giving any fucks. If you'd folk, thank you. And see, comes along here, squares this off nice, and then misses this little corner, and then comes in here and squares that off nice. You'd think it had just come around, there'd be enough material there to, to cut the whole thing, but nay. And then a big old fly cutter, just to get the surface. I'm not sure how this comes apart, but I intend to find out. Maybe have to take the belt off first, but those pulleys, I think that would come right out of the bearing housing there. Come all as a one unit. Yeah, that's her. Oh, I should take the brushes out. Brushes, brushes. Who amongst us have not split a brush clean half and two? Oh, and gotta take this little valence off. Ta-da! Here we have the current embodiment of the state-of-the-art in prime movers, an electric motor surmounted a prefabulated amulite, high permeability, magnetic permeability, mind, steel laminations in the core in order to reduce eddy currents and some wire. And we clearly see one of the typical failure modes of this tool where it's pulling dirty air through the field in through the fan and the fan with just a modicum of work has already started plugging up with wood chips. So very likely you'll let the smoke out of her because you'll get less cooling, the insulation will cook off of here, it'll fail, and then the magic blue smoke, what doesn't get back in. Now the other failure you might get is if you stall this, there is not a whole lot of torque what can be throughput that rubber band. And if you look at, it's about two to one. So if this is running at 17,000 ripples on the, on the cutting head, on the hog, then this has got to be running at 32,000. So there's lots of airflow there, but if you do stall this out, what they're relying on in order to not stall this out is the inertia of this rotating mass to actually cut and not stop because there's not a whole lot of torque actually being transmitted here. Certainly not enough torque on its own to cut a big sliver of wood. Pulleys themselves are heat shrunk interference fit on the shaft. The rotor, if I had to taste, we have 60, 63 aluminum round extrusion turned and then machined. Or no, that's an actual extrusion. You see that? That hasn't been machined. So that's been extruded this shape and then turned to the size on the OD, faced, quite roughly I might add, and then drill holes in order to get this uh, dynamically balanced for 17,000 ripples. Got a ubiquitous and cheap shielded skateboard bearing, roller blade bearing, 608Z, and another bearing, a sealed bearing. This would be a low rolling friction, uh, quite a loose bearing, and we can see it's got rubber seals on there, or maybe Viton, and a UV shield 
in order to not eat away at that rubber. Of course, the arc and anisparkin of the commutator bars has UV uh, radiation and it kills those seals in the bearing. Once the seals go, then it gets full of schmoo and to devolve into technical parlance, no worky worky. Here's the field winding, the brush holders back there with the round insulators, and those are staked on, crimped on. That's good. There's no epoxy, so lots of cooling, but kind of rattling around. I would say this isn't a, a professional tool. This is a either a home gamer or once in a while tool. If you were a professional car painter, I think that you'd get a heavier duty version of this, which they do make. I cannot foresee what the amount of shavings what get in there, this thing actually lasting. It's just, you cook the cooling off it and the motor not long for this life. If and you owned one and smoked one, please let me know in the doobly do if I'm correct or if I'm way off base. Here's the ka-chunk ka-chunk switch. It's nice that it does have uh, a lock on, a lock on, somehow. This switch strikes me as quite low duty, but it is nice. There's no electronical bullshit. It is a ka-chunk, ka-chunk switch, although the snap action is very, very mushy. Not like a nice Omron or a typical Japanese switch, which you get the snap. This, yeah. Not a nice real feeling switch, but here's the height adjustment here. It has a nicer detent, snappier detent than the switch and the center of the bore, nice and beefy. And then it relies on the casement here to not weeble wobble around too over much. Overall, I'd say this is more of a home gamer tool than a professional tool as witnessed by the manufacturer, but it does work like a hot damn. Thanks for watching. Keep your dick in a vice. I guess I ought to put this back together so I can use it. But that's the question. Normally, I don't take it apart before I use it so that there's a little, you know, you never know if you get it back together and that's part of the teardown process. If it's no fucking good at all, you'll never get it back together because the clamshell goes all sprung cattywampus and so forth. Ah, okay. Let's hold on. I'll get this back together and we'll test it. Pretty straightforward, just about back together. If this thing gives up the ghost on you, if it smells like it's burnt and there's smoke billowing out of chances, it's fucked. If you pull the trigger and nothing happens, check the brushes quickly. You'll be able to see if they're worn right down to nubs. This is a 454. You buy these anywhere. And you see that little line there? If it's worn out past theirs, it's worn plumb out. You need new brushes, not making good contact. The other thing you can do, of course, is get your handy dandy 600, well, probably more than that now, doll hair, Fruke 87V. Mess of tangled wires. Sticker like this. A sticker like this, you should have continuity there. And then you sticker like this, you should have no continuity. And then when you pull the trigger, you ought to have continuity, but since there's no continuity, what's going on? Well, there's no brushes. Now we got the brushes installed. If it wasn't good, well, it's good. Oh, or maybe not. Huh. <laughs> uh -huh. There we go. Just had to spin the brushes. 5.4 ohms you should get when it's working good. And if it's any value, you know, if it's 10 ohms or 12 ohms or something like that, you got high resistance, something going on in the motor or the switch. And if that's open circuit like that, chances are it's going to be your switch if you don't smell smoke. 